Now, as I've stressed, it's not a series of works, but a suite of works. The next image that came very strongly to me was Pozzo drinking. We have this scene where he calls for Lucky, stool, he grasps. Lucky provides a stool. Basket, he shouts. And Lucky puts the basket. And from that basket he takes out wine and sits, well, drinks, and begins to chew his chicken bone. Now, look, I have to say at this point, uh, and I, I must be careful not to try to describe uh, a production because that wouldn't be possible. So what I looked for here was the a little difference in coloration, the darkish blue and the head thrown back, a certain gross vulgarity about him, and yet I wanted also a kind of vibration, a, a vividness and life in there in it, and, I, and uh, that is I've got, I believe, I believe I've got that with the, the kind of brushwork which describes the act of this guy. Let me say, once again, if I can, please, that uh, look at the works and my description I just, by the way. Now there comes a time, you, as everyone knows in the, in, the, in the play, when Pozzo barked at a very strange command. To Lucky. Think. <laughs> it's bizarre indeed. And I had forgotten just briefly when I did this this uh, image when Lucky begins to think. His mouth opens. His finger comes up. He begins to gesticulate. He becomes like, what is it? A kind of puppet, vivified in some strange way. And I had completely forgotten that before that the hat should have come off. So this drawing is slightly, <laughs> if you can place it, this is just between the point where uh, um, Lucky's famous appearance when Potser says, look at my hair, black, he moves his hat. Now look at his, or maybe vice versa. And Lucky's hat is removed and this great slop of white hair comes down. A lovely moment in the piece, a lovely, completely absurd moment, a lovely moment in the piece. So that is where it lies in between, if you can allow that for a moment. As I say, as I say I'm not being absolutely accurate to any particular text of the piece. Mm -hmm. So he stands, he stares. Um, I, this drawing I liked extremely well because sometimes they will come directly and immediately. Often they will not do that. I have to make I have to make perhaps three or four versions of studies and sketches of it, but this didn't require it. So I think it has something in it like that. Oh, she is the, the hand begins to go up. It's a moment. How can I put it? Of preparation for the bizarre outburst that Lucky's just about to make. And here, he makes it. Can you recall anything, Margaret? Can you recall anything of that speech? It delivered up like a machine gun. A completely blank face. His face changes. He gets wilder and wilder. The hair flops about his shoulders. He becomes completely crazed. Even Pozzo begins to look alarmed and disturbed about the whole business. And he's gabbling on and on and on. He repeats over and again that same thing. For reasons unknown in time, tell he's going on like a machine gun. <laughs> And it is really, uh, 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 this is really one of the most startling moments in the entire piece. And he goes forward and forward and becomes virtually apocalyptic. Or apocalyptic, perhaps, would be the better word for it. And then you see him, he virtually falls forward like that, completely exhausted. And there they stand, Pozzo, Didi, Gogo, utterly, utterly astounded, as well they might well be. And this, I think, this particular drawing fixed it for me. Very, very effectively. <laughs> it was not, I mean, it's not a play in which scenes come to a neat and complete end, but it did in a way make a complete, complete, um, s what's the word, a, a complete scene of the opening of the play and the first part of the play and, the, and, the, uh, and everything that goes up onto this most present moment. Um, and after that, it changes slightly. Pozzo withdraws, 
Lucky is gone. And we're left with Dee Dee and Gogo once more on stage. They don't know quite what to do. What are they going to do now that they are happy? What are they going to do? They look for night. Dee Dee often turns toward the sky. Where's the night, he asks. Where's the night? One knows what he means. The play at that point becomes just edges over from comedy towards that other great element in it, which is tragedy. This was a, a work that gave me a particular satisfaction. It was very still, very solemn. It has the title simply Night. It is night. Darkness does come. They settle down. They sleep. There's a peacefulness, a great calm in that, which I think gives a wonderful moment to the play. It doesn't last long, but it so moved me that I felt I, want, I, I had to change the colour, soften everything, make everything, push everything back, as it were, into a world of sleep, a world of dreams. And, well, I can say only, there it is, if you look at it a little, I think you get some impression of that. And finally, the day comes, of course, inevitably the day comes. And um, by now, working through the series, I felt I had said all the, in a certain way, no, not said, shown, in a certain way, as much as one could, in a very, very limited, limited way. And um, there remains, of course, that famous scene, which is sad and ridiculous and comic all at once, and that is. They look at one another, they've thought about hanging themselves, but what was the use because when Gogo took his belt off and they tested to see if it would be strong enough, it wasn't. His trousers fall down, the famous uh, variety, <laughs> variety comedy act. There's much play of that kind which belongs to theatre and only theatre can do that. The last scene that everybody knows and that is so such an, so memorable without anything happening at all. They look at one another, each says to the other, let's go. The other says, yes, let's go. And they don't move. In every version I've seen, the curtain comes quietly down at that place. Now, could you imagine how it could have been done badly? But no. Uh, Becky just simply cut the play off. And I think must have left his audiences, that certainly his early audiences, with a strange sense of, of, le of leaning forward towards something's going to happen, and nothing happens. <laughs> so with these two, I did them very, very simply. The tree between them, as always, the tree, which of course has connect connotations with the cross, and with, as everyone again has remarked, often enough quotations with God. There they stand, there they are. They will leave, they will go, they will not wait for God ever. They stay, they wait, they will wait forever. <laughs> well, now, look, just a few words if I can. You might say, okay, but why all this? It entertains you to do it, you like to do it. And I say, certainly, I'm an artist, I try to produce things. But, as I said, I think in the beginning, there's, this is a tragic comedy. But when I look at it, I become aware of something very, very... What is the word? Very, very full of meaning. That the whole of this, these people cannot move, these tramps cannot go, motto cannot come, because there is no time in which they can come or go. There is no time. Time has in some strange way vanished. They are living in an absolute and total vacuum. And this was exactly the conclusions that I've been reaching in my works over a period of many years. What I was trying to do and what I was trying to represent was a complete vacuum, an emptiness. Time had died. Well, I have my own 
thoughts as to why that was, and I put that in painting. But never mind. I think that is why Beckett has come back now with so strong, so strong a feeling. You think, not that this is a play in 1953 or 54. This is a play which in some manner continues to be exactly the same 50 years later because the situation which it represents has not yet changed. Not yet. But my one, perhaps one last remark I should make about that, otherwise I'm going to become a bad philosopher, <laughs> is that uh, at this present moment, in the last three months, I'm speaking now in January, early January in 2002, in these last few months, something has happened and time has changed. There's much talk about the world changing. That is rather big and lofty, but there's a lot. Time has begun, as it were, to move in some strange way, and I feel a feeling that that is what, what the whole of the Beckett, Beckett, this one particular play, had said to me from start to finish. Time can begin again. Hey, bien, well, so be it now. Can I just finally, there is my portrait of Beckett, which was done and shows him as he was, just at about the same time as he wrote on Antonio Godot.